Praise the Lord, Morning Star. Amen. You may be seated. It is always a treat to be in the house of the Lord with God's precious people. And we also want to thank God for everybody who is tuning in online and how that has become a norm for us in these days. And as online service is important for those of you who can't be here, I also want to thank God for all of the team that is working behind the scenes that is doing a phenomenal job with all the technical aspects of what is happening. And when you're at home, you're able to catch what's happening here because there is a group of dedicated people who are volunteering to serve the Lord through this capacity. And I want to thank God for them all. And uh, just want to thank you one more time for all they're doing. I do want to thank the Lord for Bishop and First Lady and Lady Anna. Why don't we thank God for our pastoral staff. Most of all, we're thankful for what Jesus has done in our lives, how he has saved us and he has kept us. Isn't it just a blessing to be saved in these last days? Um, if there was ever a time to be saved, it is today. Amen? If you ain't going to get it now, I don't know what it's going to take for you to get it, but I'm thankful that you have got it, that you're walking in it, and that you are being blessed in what God is doing in this specific time and hour that we're living in. Well, we welcome you to Wednesday night adult Bible study, and uh, we're thankful for the Word of God. And I, I want to say that I am thankful that I do live in a country where the Word of God has not been persecuted to the point where we can't uh, assemble and teach and preach on these things. And we pray that it never happens, but I'm thankful that we have these liberties, amen, to study the Word of God, to assemble together, and uh, just take apart the Word of God and be enriched by it. That being said, the title that Lord has given me this evening is, It Starts in the Mind and Ends Up in the Hands. I know it's a lengthy title, but this is where uh, the Lord has directed me. The title is, it's, It Starts in the Mind and It Ends Up in the Hands. Let's uh, bow our head and just offer up a word of prayer over this Bible study. Father, I thank you for your truth, for your word, and for your spirit that has led us, that has guided us. Teach us tonight. Give us all, all of us strong meat that we would have a level of maturity in sound doctrine. We also pray for our nation, asking for healing throughout the land, and we're asking that you would allow us to be examples, and we're praying that this word, Father, would be a part of that process. In the precious name of Jesus, everybody say amen. 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 Again, the titles, it starts in the mind and ends up in the hands. This Bible study, uh, one of the seed thoughts came from this quote that I want to share with you. And of course, we're going to teach with scripture. It's not just going to be commentary. But um, I think this quote was very fitting. So David S. Norris has written a book entitled I Am. And his quote is, covenant relationship with the creator is constituted and sustained by human response. And I'm going to say that again. Covenant relationship with the creator is constituted and sustained by human response. And I'm going to tell you this tonight. If you are taking notes or mental notes, uh, make sure that you... Uh, this is going to be a different kind of Bible study. The Lord has put some things in my heart that um, I'm going to try to pause on certain thoughts, yet I have a lot of material that God has given me, so there may be stopping and rushing all kind of mixed in, but I really believe that God is, is going to speak to us again, and I'm going to read this quote again. Hopefully we have it. Covenant relationship with the Creator is constituted and sustained by human Response. I'm sure our system went down. If not, we're, we're getting it back up online. I'd like to give examples when I teach. I think that every time that there's a story or an, an allegory, it helps us understand what is happening in the spiritual. I'm going to talk about the power company and use this as an example. A good local power company services its community without any interruptions. This company delivers energy needed to heat and to cool a facility according to the seasonal changes. This company can serve a vast territory and massive amounts 
of much needed resources. This is their job. This is their responsibility to distribute power. Can somebody say amen? But in order to receive and maintain this power, a homeowner or a business owner must, and this is a key part that I want you to catch, must agree to the terms that the power company has established. Must agree to the terms that the power company has established. These utilities are able to reach all of its neighbors, its neighborhoods, but permission is only granted through approval by the hosting source. Approval is granted only through the hosting source or the company that is giving these resources. In Psalms 139 and 8, the Bible tells us, if I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You see, as I'm talking about a power source, a local power source, we understand that God is a power source. And he is where all life begins and where all energy flows from. And we understand that if we try to evade him by going high or low, we're not going to be able to because he is already there. This ever-giving power source, our God is is everywhere. We, we, we can't escape from his presence and from his power. You can't escape his presence, and where he is, where God is, there is liberating power. But just because he is omnipresent means he's all present. And just because he is omnipotent means he's all powerful. His presence and his power is unlimited and not confined. So we understand that our God is a wonderful God. He is not limited in his location. He's not limited in power. His presence and power is present. It's right there. But just because that is the case doesn't mean that everyone has access to this freedom that can deliver you from sin, death, and hell. In other words, because God is everywhere and he is all-powerful, he's able to distribute his power to any location and to any person doesn't mean that every human gets that delivery. Everyone gets that source of power. So just because, and this is a note that I want you to take, just because it is available doesn't mean that it is accessible. Just because his power is available doesn't mean everybody is getting it. And I'm trying to draw on these examples so that it's going to help us understand what God is, is um, speaking to us concerning our title and our theme. Just because it is available does not mean that it is accessible. Let me give you a really simple example. You could be Holy Ghost filled and God's power could be just ministering to you. But you could, in, in a church service, and there could be somebody next to you that's high, that is somewhere else, that is here in the location, but is not receiving that power, that is not receiving that transforming uh, a force in their life. We have to... We have to tap into why or understand why one person receives the grace of God, the power of God, and another person doesn't. And this is a part of the Bible study. Familiar passage in John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should, perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as we're talking about a power source that's able to distribute power and we're talking about God who has unlimited power, we understand that Jesus died for the entire world. His sacrifice was good enough for all of humanity. If everybody was to approach and serve the Lord right, then his power is able to heal and to deliver and save everyone. 
But to access this everlasting life requires a type of belief that gives full access to his grace. So just because he died for the world doesn't mean that the whole entire world is saved. Can somebody say amen? A covenant is an agreement between two parties. Everybody say covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two parties. Typically, one party is greater. In theology, it is an agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. I'm going to say that again. In theology, it is an agreement. We're talking about covenant. It's an agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. I can say this, that if your power gets shut off, it's typically because you broke the agreed terms of service by not paying your bill. Can somebody say amen? It wasn't because the power company couldn't deliver resources to your house. What I'm trying to get at is there is a responsibility that we have when we receive something of value. And we're living in a day where, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, I know that if I just go ahead and bury myself into my notes, sometimes I do lose the, the congregation sometimes. Or So I know that there's like a balance between notes, giving you information, and also just talking to you. But the essence of what the Lord has given me is there is a human response that we need to have in light of God's grace and God's mercy in his salvation. And we're living in a day where the enemy is trying to take that away from the church. You could see that in praise and worship, that if God really has saved you, if God has delivered you, if God has touched your mind, then in the spirit of appreciation, your response is, Lord, you are creator of heaven and earth. You have touched my life, and I am going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to exalt. My response is, I'm going to clap my hands. My response is, I'm going to lift up my hands. My response is, I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. My response is, I'm going to testify because you saved me. I, I was going straight to hell. I was addicted to this and that, and I had so many problems, but my human response was, because you gave me your liberating power, there's something that I'm going to have to do about it. And as I said, we're living in a day where many church leaders are trying to take away your response to the truth that has been delivered unto you. The reason a church is dead is because there is no response. There is no call and answer. And in these last days, I know that everything has changed, you know, with where we're seating and social distancing. But let me remind you, there still is a response that you must offer within this season, within this circumstance that, Lord, I still can praise you. I might not be able to run the aisles, or I mean, but my God, I can do something about your goodness, and, and, and I can still praise you. I can still worship you. I can still tell you and show you how much I love you, and Lord, I will passionately display this uh, among the brethren. I'm not going to be in fear. I'm not going to be in doubt, but I am part of the church of the living God that I'm going to make a ruckus. I'm going to make a shout. Uh, I'm going to make a statement, a declaration that my God is good. But I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to be fearful. With this type of power at your local residence, you agree to receive and pay for the service. If you can't afford what was agreed upon, your circumstances don't change the contract. Just because you can't pay the bill doesn't mean that your circumstances change what was agreed upon initially. Right. And although we thank God for leniency and we thank God for, 
for, for, for uh, companies that work with us and help us out when we're struggling. But we have to understand this principle that when something has been established and you agree upon it, we're talking about covenant, we're talking about power, but when you have agreed upon something and you said this is, this is what our, our agreement's going to be and you signed your name or you shook somebody's hand, you have to understand that circumstances do not change the contract. How many married folk we have in here? Marriage is a covenant. Till death do you part. I'm tired of hearing people, well, I didn't put in for this. I didn't know that my husband was going to be so lazy or I didn't know my wife was going to be, you know, this and that. I didn't put in for this. I didn't know this was going to be this way. Well, guess what? You're under contract. <laughs> You're in covenant. The only thing that's going to separate you is death or some form of adultery. That's what the scripture says. You know, you may have your preferences that are getting in the way of that, but the bottom line, marriage is an example of our covenant between God. You get to a point in time in your life and your walk with God where you may have started off all rosy and everything was good, and then you hit, you know, sickness or you hit some relationship issues or, or financial hardship or, you know, you're struggling in your mind or this and that. You may have had loss or tragedy in your life, and you may tell God, I didn't put in for this. I didn't know that this was on the horizon. I didn't know that that person would turn their back on me. And I didn't know that I would fail in this department. Or I didn't know that I would be experiencing this. But we have to be reminded that we are in covenant with God. Come hell or high water, we have made up our mind that we are going to serve him. And we're going to trust in him. And we're going to magnify him until we pass on. Your circumstances don't change covenant. Your circumstances don't change. Well, I don't have the friends that I thought I would have, or I, I'm not, you know, uh, I don't have this, or I don't have that, or, you know, I'm just unhappy where I am at. Bottom line is that you have to be a soldier for Christ, and you can't be fair weather. You can't join an army and say, you know what, I don't feel like laying my life down anymore. But when you signed up, you signed your life away for a cause. Samson had supernatural ability. It was given to him from God. But there was an understanding, an agreement that he and his parents understood. Can somebody say amen? amen. There was this understanding because of what was given to him. Because of what was given to him, there were restrictions, there were conditions, and there were expectations in his life and also in his parents' life. The angel came and said, this is what he can't do. He has this vow upon his life. He can't touch anything that is dead. He can't drink anything of the vine. He can't cut his hair. These are the expectations that are in his life. Why? Because there was a, something special. There was something amazing that was given to him. And when something great is given to But he was morally weak. He was given great physical power. When God gives you something, he don't take it away. He doesn't. But there is a but here. He doesn't take it away, but Samson had to relinquish it by disobedience or by breaking agreement. The source was there. You're called to do this. You've been called to deliver. You've been called, you've been anointed. You've been Amen. put in this time and season. That power, that source was feeding him all the time, and it wasn't going to stop. God's not a liar. He can't take his word back. When he speaks something into existence, it's going to happen. It's unlimited. It's, 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 this is God. Yet we see something 
very powerful, that although that source was unlimited, Samson had a responsibility to keep up with what God had asked of him and his family Amen. to do. There was an agreement, a contract, a vow, whatever you want to call it, that this is the thing, Samson, I, I'm going to bless you with this power. You're, you're, you're going to have the ability to do great things. But your responsibility is to maintain what the agreement Amen. has been. Amen. Regardless of circumstance, regardless of, of temptation, regardless of what your hang-ups might be, bottom line, God was good to him. And even though Samson tempted the Lord, and he acted the fool for a good while. And even though the first time he stepped out and he, he sought out a woman uh, uh, of the Philistines that he shouldn't have been seeking out, God didn't take his power away. He didn't initially just fall apart. But it took a little bit of time of him messing around that eventually he put himself in a position where he rendered himself weak. Not God, but he rendered himself weak weak because of his disobedience. The consistency here is that God doesn't take back his power. He doesn't change the agreement. The covenant stays in place. Or if there is a failure, it is on our end. God is good all the time. I said God is good all the time. All the time. When we're on the mountaintop, God is good. When we're in the valley low, God is good. His promises are yes and amen. When he says that he's going to do something on your behalf, my God is going to do it. He is powerful. He is amazing. My God is everything. Can I tell, tell some of you the reason that you are here, even though you have failed many times in your life, is because God is good. Even though you've made mistakes and even though you've tripped up along the way, the reason that you're still standing, the reason you still have an opportunity, the reason you still have peace of mind, even through your hardships, is because God is good. And when he calls something into existence, he's not going to take it back. And the reason that you have joy and peace is because God is good. And even though when you frustrate the grace of God and you step out of his will, that word is still there for a season. Make sure you don't stay there too long because our God is good. See, faith must become faithfulness for it to be complete. Faith must become faithfulness in order for it to become or for it to be complete. I'm going to say this. Too many supposed pastors, preachers, and teachers are taking the emphasis away from our responsibility. Everybody say, my responsibility. And replacing it with irresponsibility and calling it grace. They're taking away our job, our responsibility, and our place in the kingdom by giving people false notions of what is right and wrong according to Amen. salvation. Modern theology has hijacked the proper response to the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and their hijack is what I call easy beliefism. This hijacking of the gospel is what I'm calling easy beliefism. Easy beliefism deceives the believer into thinking that he or she has fulfilled all the requirements God has demanded of man by one simple act of believing in him alone. They've hijacked the truth, the gospel, by injecting this false doctrine. The scripture does tell, tell us that 
As we read earlier, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the incarnation and belief in it is absolutely paramount. We are all for faith. But this passage is not an end all, but it is a beginning yeah. to all. It's not an end all. It's a starting point that we have to understand. Yes, we have faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But just to have belief in him alone is not enough for us to make it in these last days. If you get a chance to take this note, take this note down. Faith is the means by which man accepts and receives God's saving grace. Faith is the means by which man accepts and receives God's saving grace. Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm not here to cheapen faith because it is essential to your salvation. Rather, I'm here to follow faith, to follow faith's full path. You're going to run into somebody that's going to tell you that, yes, I'm saved or I'm a Christian, simply because they believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and God. And that's enough for them. But I feel that there have been too many teachers and preachers that have put people in a position where they're at a spiritual disadvantage because they don't have the power in their life. They don't have the understanding and the, the revelation to fight against demonic forces and to really walk in, in holiness and freedom. Why? Because they have a portion, a part of the gospel. But their response has not been full and their response has been partly faulty. How can you practice any level of diligence without a response or a form of action? The scripture says that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It says that without faith you can't please God, but then it says it's a, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How could you diligently seek him by just mental assent. There has to be a response that is greater than, yes, I received him as my Lord and Savior. I've said the sinner's prayer. You, we all understand that alone is not in the scriptures. There's something more to our walk with God. There has to be a deeper uh, uh, relationship. There, there has to be more than just this. And I believe that there are people that are in these last days that they have experienced this. And we're not to take away from your faith. And we're, we're not to tear down what you believe. But I'm here to tell you that there is a better way. And maybe God has allowed you to tap into to what is happening here to give you a full experience. That somebody would receive the Holy Ghost. That somebody would be truly forgiven. That somebody would be baptized. Somebody would walk in a level of holiness that they've never walked before. That is his goal for our lives. As we continue on faith, Ephesians 2 and 8 tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It says that you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So I'm going through some passages that EC, or I said that well, almost like a Hispanic uh, uh, accent there. I said, EC, EC beliefism. <laughs> Easy beliefism. Sometimes you get a little caught up up here. <laughs> My roots came out. But the scripture says that for by grace you're saved through faith and not of yourself. We're not saying that it's your works that are going to save you. It's not your own self-righteousness that can save you. We understand that by grace, through faith, we are saved. But let, let me go a little more into that. But these are the passages that they look at and they take a surface uh, uh, attempt at understanding them and they give you this is the whole counsel of God, okay? Let's define grace and mercy real quick. 
Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, and I'll explain a little more of this, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Do we have in our scriptures, or are we, we're not there, or our quotes? Again, grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So let's apply this theory in Ephesians 2 and 12. At that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants, everybody say covenants, covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Right. As Gentiles, we were aliens from the covenant of promise. As Gentiles. But because of Christ and his blood being applied to our lives, his grace looked past our being on the outside and said, come to me and I will give you rest. So when the scripture says that we were strangers from the covenants of promise, but through Christ now you have an opportunity. Can I tell you that we were double negative here. We were deficit, not just because we weren't Jews, but because we were sinners and we were Gentiles as well. So the grace that has fallen into our life, we should more, be more appreciative than anyone else. Because we were strangers and we were aliens from the covenants of promise. We couldn't walk in agreement with God because we, uh, our, our fathers uh, didn't believe in the one true God, but they were pagans. And we have to have this sense of, Lord, your grace found me. I shouldn't be saved. I was on the outside looking in, but because the veil was torn, because you sent your son to die for the entire world, now I have an opportunity, my God, to come to an apostolic altar, and, and, and I can be adopted into the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I can read the word of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I can understand what faith is, what grace is, what salvation is, what redemption is, sanctification, justification. I, all of a sudden, now God has accepted us into the fold, all because of his grace. We started off on the wrong foot. We were born in sin, shaping iniquity. But because of his grace, now we have a different response. This is a really good example of grace in the Old Testament. Joshua 24 and 13 tells us, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities you did not build. And ye dwell, or you dwell in them, you eat from vineyards and olive yards, and you did not plant. Did they deserve the city by way of planting or building? I want you to think about that for a minute. Did they deserve the promised land because they built houses or they planted vineyards or they did some kind of works? They did not. They didn't deserve those things and they didn't step into them because God had built them cities and prepared a place for them, okay? But it took, but, but grace said it's yours. And I want you to see this. They didn't build the houses, they didn't plant the vineyards, but grace said it's yours. It took a level of faith to travel past the wilderness to get there for one, okay? It took another level of faith to accept what God had prepared for them. And then three, it took another level of faith to maintain it, okay? They didn't build the houses, they didn't prepare, they didn't plant in that place, they didn't sow into that place, but they, but grace said, you know what, I'm gonna give it to you. Promise says I'm gonna give it to you. Favor says I'm gonna give it to you but it was their responsibility to have enough faith to say, I'm gonna get through this wilderness. I'm, gonna, I'm going to not just get through this wilderness experience, but I'm also gonna have enough faith to, to accept the fact that you've given me something great. It took a level of faith every time. 
It took another level of faith then to maintain what God had given them. Was it by their strength? Was it by their power or their own righteousness? No, it was by God's divine promises unto them and his grace that allowed them to have that. Yet they still had a responsibility. Much like us, we didn't do anything to deserve God pardoning our sins, for God filling us with his spirit, for him washing us through baptism in his name. We didn't do anything to deserve it. But by faith, we said we are going to be, we're going to be responsible to your commands. We're going to be obedient to the scriptures. And, and we thank you for grace that you've opened the door. And by faith now, we're going to move in. We're going to accept. And we are going to respond properly to your truth. It takes a level of faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Titus 2 and 11 tells us also concerning grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, or hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The grace of God has shown us such appreciation the grace of God that brought salvation that appeared, excuse me, to everyone has taught us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. This is grace. We don't, walk, we don't want to walk in sin anymore. But now, because of his spirit, we have the power to deny what once controlled us. His grace met us. His favor met us. And we accepted it. Lord, I, I want a different life. I want change for my family. He could have met somebody else. He could have found somebody else. But because he came down your way, faith leapt out of your spirit and said, I want to respond. I want to know you. I want to believe you. I want to believe in you. And I don't want just to have faith to, to accept it, but I want to have faith to live it. And because you have that living, working faith in your life, you're a walking, moving, talking miracle because His grace found you and faith responded. Can somebody say amen? If you don't mind taking this note, our mental ascent should grow into action based relationship. Our mental assent. Assent means express approval or agreement. Our mental approval, agreement, should grow into action-based relationship. And this is where I'm going to inject my title True faith starts in the mind and it ends up in the hands. True faith starts in the mind and it ends up in the hands. We have a powerful church here. We could call an event this Saturday and we could build a, a huge wall around this place because of the faith that is in this place. And I truly believe that God has gifted us with faith to the point that we believe in our minds and then it transfers to our hands. The reason that you can accomplish so many things even at your job is I believe because faith got a hold of you and you understand that it starts in your mind. You believe and then you begin to work it out. But if you're dealing with negativity, if you're dealing with pessimism, and if you're dealing with fate, and all oh, this always happens to me, and oh, woe well, is me, and you know, how come, you know, my neighbor never has to deal with this, but I'm always having to struggle, and you know, I don't see anybody else going through what I'm going through. You're never gonna operate in a true level of faith. You have to respond even when it's difficult and say, you know what? My body's messed up, I'm struggling in my mind, all, uh, there's not a whole lot of money in the bank. There's all kinds of issues going on. But you know what? I believe 
that God has intended something greater for me. Therefore, by my hands, I'm going to start working it out. I don't know how. I don't know where the power is going to come from. I don't know what's going to happen. But all of a sudden, in my mind, I believe it. And then I start working it out. And then we start responding in faith. This is how we sculpt our families as fathers. We see as a good father, he sees his family and his children as a family of God in the order and scriptures of God. Then he takes the word of God and he begins to sculpt his family according to the word of God. And when things go haywire and go out of line, you still grab a hold of that faith and say, no, this is what thus saith the word of God. As for me and my house, we will serve God. We are going to, this is going to be a house of prayer. We're going to magnify him because it began in the mind and it worked itself out through our hands. So as we go back to our kind of our seed thought of the Bible study, by the apostolic author David S. Norris. He said, covenant relationship with the creator is constituted and sustained by human response. Give you another minute just to look at that, meditate upon it. Covenant relationship with the creator is constituted and sustained by human response. This is salvation in a nutshell. And, and we need to ask ourselves this question. What is my responsibility to God in light of his holiness and his glory? What is my, my responsibility to God in light of his holiness and his glory? Because covenant is extended by grace. We shouldn't even have an option. But grace gives us an opportunity to choose. He is true. He is faithful. He is unwavering. And my response will be yes. I will choose him again and again. And I will meditate on his goodness and I will operate in the realm of faith. Why? Because he has given us this ability. He has met us. He has been so gracious. He has been so kind. I will say this in closing. Faith in Jesus will cause you to put on Christ. And would you put on Christ, whatever is done is not you. When you are baptized into Christ, Christ, when he died, his blood was shed. And it dealt with the burial. So when we are water baptized, the blood is applied to us. And in that, we're now hidden in him, and once we are baptized into Christ Jesus, now any work that we do is not us, but it's him. So we can't take the glory for anything that happens. All we can do is respond by faith to God and say, God, if you've called me to preach, God, then it's you preaching through me. If you called me to sing, it's you singing through me. If you called any holiness or anything beautiful in my life, it's because you are doing it that way. It's not our own works. It's not our own ability. But it's him working through us. He gets the credit. He gets the glory. So my response to his glory, my response to his holiness is, it is you that is doing it. Why? because I'm buried with you. I am in Christ now. Those who have been baptized into him have put him on. So you can accuse us all you want of us being works-based, but it's God doing the works through us. It's him working through you. When somebody's healed, it's him. That's behind your hand, that's laying your head on your babies. When you have the gifts, that God has placed you now. It's him work. It's his gifts working through you. 
It doesn't go to your credit, but you have to have your response. You have to have a faith response to the gospel. Can somebody say amen? amen. If you would stand with me. Another beautiful thing about this is that, have you ever noticed that baptism is not a work? How many of you are professional baptizees? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, you know, I get baptized. That's, that's, I get baptized. That's what I do. You know, when you get baptized, somebody else has to baptize you. Right. It's not you. It's not your, oh, I'm going to get baptized again today, a baptizee. That's, it, it's, it's somebody else baptizing you. So they can say it's, oh, it's because of you're doing work. I, I didn't baptize myself. And it wasn't my own name. But all it was was submission to my God. I want to be identified with your death so I can be resurrected with your resurrecting power. Amen. Amen, amen. I know that we're um, about done here, and I am going to ask Sister Leanna to come up and close this Bible study out. Why don't we thank the Lord for his goodness?